a star Intricately designed to perform a program The canopy broke and brought rain to the earth Our lifespan cut short, exposed to the sun Welcome to Beastly Theories. Uh, I'm Andy McGrath, your host. Today I've got Jonathan David Wickham. And he's a cryptozoology author and researcher. He's founder of the group um, Living Pterosaurs. He's braved the jungles of Papua New Guinea in search of the elusive Ropen and investigated and interviewed eyewitnesses of living pterosaurs around the world. Uh, his book, which I have, Searching for Ropens and Finding God, is, is a great read for anyone interested in this lesser known area of cryptozoology. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Jonathan, how are you? Welcome to the show. Oh, great. Thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, fantastic. Now, I understand it's um, it's just 5 p.m. Uh, mountain time there at the moment. Yeah. Nice and bright. We're on um, we're just after 12, actually, 12 a.m. Oh. in the morning in the UK. But um, that's that's actually good time for me, night owl time. Oh. Now, I do have quite a few questions for you. I really love the book a lot. You know, it was really great for me to to see all of the research that went into it. Now, uh, I understand that you've traveled to Papua New Guinea in search of, of the rope, and so maybe we'd just start by telling us a bit about your expeditions there, and, and for those people who are not aware yet, what is the rope? Yes, yeah, a good question. I've been working on this for 15 years, and there's a, many different directions we can go. I can just try to get an introductory kind of a, uh, uh, of a sense of it. The Ropen, as far as we can tell, my associates and I, uh, and I have a, a fair number of associates and around a dozen that are active, um, we believe that the Ropen is a modern rampharynchoid pterosaur. That is, it's uh, not extinct and it's very much alive, it's nocturnal, and generally, uh, there may be more than one species, but generally, as far as we can tell, it, it has a bioluminescence, an intrinsic bioluminescent capability, where it can glow at night to get certain things done for hunting, catching fish, or other things. But it's a long-tailed, featherless, uh, flying creature that's very unlike a bat, and generally mm -hmm. more larger than a bat, generally even quite larger than the fruit bats. Wow. Uh, now... You, obviously, you've been to, to Papua New Guinea to, to investigate this. Um, what, what did you find? There? Did you find any evidence of this creature, uh, physical evidence or uh, photographic film evidence? Well, I uh, guess we should start with uh, a little bit about how I got there. It's, it's oh, lot. yes. But we'll, we'll, we'll make it brief. But I was a forensic videographer in 2003 when I was first introduced to... Uh, the possibility of, uh, of non-extinct pterodactyls, as people call them, non-extinct pterosaurs in Papua New Guinea. And I saw some video footage from a Paul Nation in Texas, who had been there on uh, one or two, actually two expeditions. He'd been there by that time in late 2003. And I was fascinated because I could tell that the natives were very credible. I, I'm, I'm, this my profession is videotaping um, uh, people for 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 forensic work for uh, attorney firms, oh, okay. and mostly in California, and um, I could see that the natives were telling the truth. They're not just making up tales or just only repeating uh, repeating their native superstitions. So there is one exception, perhaps, but generally they were just telling uh, the Americans what they saw. And I was very impressed. And to make a long story short, a year later, I went there myself, led my own expedition. I got my own interpreter on the mainland and we traveled to Umboy Island. The natives were called Siasi. In World War II, it was called Rook Island. But generally, uh, outside of Papua New Guinea, it's called Umboy Island. I didn't have any success with actually finding the creature during the two weeks that my interpreter and I were there. But my interpreter was able to see it when I was asleep one night. I just couldn't stay up the whole night. And I, uh, I went to bed. And then about an hour later, I think it was, is when he and another uh, village leader in Gumlagan area, well, they saw the rope and flying across Mount Bell. And uh, it, was, it did have the bioluminescent glow. 
So I didn't see anything, but I was able to get some wonderful interviews. Oh, wonderful interviews. You know, the end of my expedition. Uh, uh, they were just perfect. I could not have hoped for more for, for interviewing eyewitnesses. That's, uh, that's really fantastic. Now, I, I read some parts of the book. I also believe that I, I saw some of um, the bioluminescent clips, perhaps on, on the Monster Quest, was that the one that Garth Gessman and, and Paul Nation appeared on? I, I believe it was one of these, these very popular cryptozoology documentaries that was on Discovery and a few other channels back in the uh, early noughties. Um, now, in this particular area, you, you talked about these animals exhibiting a, a bioluminescent glow of some kind. Is, is that something that is just featured in uh, in Papua New Guinea, or or are there other pterosaur sightings around the world that have this same glow? And, and on top of that, if you could also tell us maybe some of the areas in the world where, where pterosaurs have been sighted. Yes. It gets complicated because it's not just Papua New Guinea. We have some credible testimonies there and daylight side sightings of, of very large flying creatures. That's wonderful. But we also have apparent bioluminescent pterosaurs in other parts of the world. And this is what is incredible. These animals are not common, of course, and they're nocturnal. Otherwise, they would have been discovered officially and scientifically uh, long ago. But they're not so common, not so much rare as just nocturnal and scattered across a number of continents. Over the past 15 years, I've received direct testimony from my witnesses from all continents except South America and Antarctica, and I don't expect to ever get any from Antarctica. But uh, I have also had some indirect reports from South America. So basically, these animals all over, and there are a number of reports, many reports, uh, that suggest that uh, what is observed are the bioluminescent ones, the ones that have that cap capability, though they don't, they don't make any glow in the daytime. So mm -hmm. the, best sighting, the best sightings are in the daytime. And that's when we get information about the tail and the flange at the end of the tail, the, the, um, the, um, the uh, horn-like, a horn-like, if I can get it, like, a horn-like crest coming out the back of the head. Um, we get those in daylight sight sightings in general, and that's when we get the good views. But the, but we do have reports that correlate with uh, bioluminescence in North America and, and other parts of the world too. Yes, I see. And um, I mean, it, to me, it's amazing. Uh, you write in your book about fire-breathing dragons and how these bioluminescent abilities, these capabilities, could have been mistaken in, you know, in more ancient times for for breathing fire and that to me makes a lot of sense actually yeah. um, now in your study do you do you look at a lot of ancient legends and reports of of fire breathing dragons and, and other things like that in similar areas to where modern pterosaurs are reported do you try to make that correlation it's fast that is a fascinating subject and i i, I don't delve into it as deeply as some of my associates like uh, Garth Gessman and David Wetzel, who do, do deep research in, in these uh, old accounts that people used to call dragons, because what we now call ropens, people in old times, they called dragons. And we need to remember that, that there's not any particular time in history when they're more common. They're, they've always been around. I don't see anything that indicates there's any difference in how these anim flying animals um, uh, act and appear to people and interact with people differently now than they did uh, centuries ago. They're just, we have different names for them. We have a different cultures that interact with how we, um, how we deal with something like this. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a very different culture here in Western countries now than we, than uh, in the same countries in Europe and the United States a few centuries ago. It's a very different culture. So, and we have different words for these animals, but they're, but they're real. I'm sure I've lost sure, what your question was. Well, no, it was just about um, the, the other locations in the world uh, as well where, where some of these things have been cited. And I, I saw in the book you mentioned Australia, you mentioned the United States, um, and almost, you say almost all continents on Earth, uh, you, you've got reports from direct reports. Um, in, in all of these sightings around the world, do you, um, do you notice that 
the same species of pterosaur are being described? And if it's not the same species in every case, have you been able to identify different species that corroborate specimens we have in the fossil record? So you mentioned the rampharynchoid uh, for the Europan, for example. Are there other sightings around the world that seem to correlate with a different uh, species of pterosaur? Yeah, so now this is uh, um, this is shocking, extraordinary, unbelievable, whatever you want to call it. It's extraordinary that over the 15 years I've been ca gathering eyewitness sightings, excuse me, <coughs> eyewitness sighting reports and getting emails from people, mostly email, uh, there is more than one species, definitely, and there generally appears to be uh, an indication that there are two major types of pterosaurs still living. Now, mm -hmm. we know from fossils that there are generally two, in general, there are two types of pterosaurs. There's the long tails and the short tails. There's more to it than that, having to do with the, the way that the neck connects with the body, you know, and that kind of thing, and the way that the tail is. But, not just the length of the tail, but we also have the same thing in modern pterosaurs. Apparently, the, the rampharynchoid is interesting enough, and this has some correlation with the biblical creation, but uh, the rampharynchoid-like ropens, we call them ropens, they are far more common. In fact, uh, one study I did up to the end of the year 2012 indicated a huge ratio in favor, like I think something like 19 to 1 ratio of of the rampharynchoid types in relate in relation to the the much fewer sightings of the pterodactyl types. Mm -hmm. over, over, over all the years up to the present, it's not quite a 19 to 1 ratio, but it's still a big ratio. People generally see the long-tailed ones, which are um, thought by many scientists to have basically gone the way of extinction before the uh, the other time. So the ones that are supposed to be extinct longer are the ones that we have most of. Interesting. I see. I see. I see. But that is, I think that is very, very interesting. Actually, I, I do a lot of study on lake monsters and, of course, around the world in, in different lakes or, or different coastal areas, you do seem to find a, a variation of what I would describe as plesiosaur-like species. So I just thought that it would make sense that, that would happen. But the rampharynchoid's been more more popular or more um, uh, prolific. That that is very surprising to me. Now, people might have a lot of trouble, obviously, with accepting that pterosaurs are still alive. Being to cryptozoology, this, this is something that I deal with all the time, whether it's with lake monsters or or any other kind of. Um, living dino as, as they might be referred to or undiscovered animal like the bigfoot um what do you what do you say to the the skeptics you know when people when you first broach this this um subject with people or if you're researching in an area uh, where you've had a sighting of a pterosaur and you, you wanted to get a bit of information out of the locals how do you go in there without seeming a little bit crazy <laughs> well well <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. It's it's very challenging. Um, uh, keep in mind that over the past 15 years, my associates and I have done lots and lots of research. I've spent more time than anybody else, as far as I know, um, uh, in um, you know thousands of hours of, of work on it over the 15 years, and I've uh, written and published over a thousand, well over a thousand blog posts and web pages, and a number of books and a scientific paper and a peer-reviewed uh, journal of science. Um, generally, we have to accept that in our culture, and it's basically the same in the United States, uh, England, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, most of Western Europe, it's, it's basically the same situation we're in. Mm -hmm. I can't um, really uh, expect people to just hear me talk for a, for a, for a couple minutes about what I do and have it be uh, credible to them. Uh, you need to have more experience and know what the depth of this um, uh, searching and researching has been. Uh, there are, of course, obvious uh, other interpretations. I say, well, misidentification. Somebody saw a bird and they're 
and they were hoping it was a pterosaur, and so they, they thought it was a pterosaur. That we that's been looked into for years and researched. It's it doesn't work for the worldwide sightings, not at all. Um, could say, well, uh, perhaps there's hoaxes. Well, statistically, my analysis uh, of many uh, eyewitness reports shows that in three different ways, that three different ways, uh, hoaxes are eliminated statistically. They, 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 this is not not real, and each one of those three is independent of the other two. It's just hoaxes do not explain the sightings in general. Mm -hmm. uh, hallucinations don't. About half of the eyewitnesses were not alone. And it's, it's, it's kind of too much to believe that different people in different parts of the world and, and groups of up to two or more uh, get, have hallucinations of the same thing. And then we need to remember that the descriptions coming in from different parts of the world or from people from different cultures, different languages, different mm -hmm. backgrounds. And they're reporting similar things, sometimes with similar words, sometimes with different words. And um, that's not a sign of hallucination or, or anything like that. And um, people are not, uh, humans don't have this in, innate capacity to hallucinate pterodactyls. It's just not realistic. You know, I, I would really agree with that, actually. And on my side, I deal with this frail brained, um, you know, scientific brush off explanation all of the time. Uh, with some subjects in cryptozoology, like Bigfoot, for example, it's very popular. So the, the likelihood of hoaxing is greater. The, um, the likelihood of seeing a bear and imagining a Bigfoot is greater. But who's thinking about pterosaurs being out there? What random witnesses out in the woods or near a lake or on an island somewhere thinking that they might see a pterosaur? It's not very popular. You're one of the very few people I've been able to discover who's actually studying this. So to me, that explanation of um, pterosaurs on the brain doesn't seem to, to make much sense to me. I have noticed uh, there's a, a big dismissal of anecdotal evidence uh, within various communities, especially when it comes to late monsters and, and other things. But in all of those sightings, there's a lot of corroboration. And as you like, like you said, amongst unrelated eyewitnesses in diverse parts of the world who would be considered antagonistic to have no interest in this particular subject. And oftentimes, I, I think what people don't realize about witnesses is nothing good happens to them because they come out and, and relate this experience. They're not rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. They don't become famous. In fact, it's the opposite, isn't it? You know, um, people actually lose credibility. They might lose um, respect if it's a small community or a village of some kind. And I think that's a, it's a big subject. So in this particular instance, I would be, I would be more likely to believe that um, you know, a credible person had seen a pterosaur than, than not seen one. Of course, we've got big animals like herons and pelicans and all kinds of things that can be seen from afar and, and mistaken. So maybe that's a good point to, to, um, you know, to go on to here. What type of birds could people see and mistake for pterosaurs? What, what types of birds have a similar appearance from afar perhaps <clears throat> well that's that's an excellent question and a good direction to go go with there um andy thank you um uh, first of all uh, you know when i make these statements about uh, living pterosaurs i need to be a little more specific try to be clear on this i often use the phrase apparent pterosaur when i refer to a particular sighting because uh, I'm not jumping to conclusions that anybody that sends me an email and reports a pterodactyl is necessarily uh, seen a living pterosaur. So I take it with an open mind and I compare it with other sightings and I keep it in my computer and I have it there for comparing and, and researching later. Generally, the vast majority of eyewitnesses, though, uh, do appear to have seen a living pterosaur. And you're, you're correct that there's no reason for them to make up something like that. They get... Uh, all kinds of trouble from it and make people making fun of them. Even, I mean, this one lady, just about a, less than a year ago, I think, it was, she sent me emails that says, and they talked about the, the, this flying creature she said, and you know, it's a, I don't know if it was a flying dinosaur she called it or pterodactyl, but it was, she said, yeah, my mom thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> That's her mother. <laughs> it's not something people would want to. <laughs> to see, often people say, "I wish I didn't see her. I wish I was not alone and somebody else." Yeah. Me, you know, 
and or they say, "Oh, I'm so grateful. I found your web page." And thinking that I have one web page, you know, and I have way over a thousand. But they say, "I found your web page, and now I'm relieved that that um, I'm not crazy, or no, <laughs> or somebody else has seen it." So I'm very happy with that. But what was the gist of that last question you had? It was was it, was it related to um, the reasons uh, for for believing eyewitnesses, like uh, related? Well, I, I would just basically what what type of uh, yes uh, on that that point about witnesses losing credibility when they come forward. I, I think that's yeah, that's a, a great answer on that actually. But um, sure that there may be some types of birds, however, that people yeah. could mistake for looking prehistoric if they they not seen yeah. one before in an in an exotic location like Papua New Guinea. What types of things could you see and say? to the uninitiated at a distance that has a pterosaurian let's just make that a word uh, appearance yes that's an excellent question i'm sorry i forgot it i got uh, off on another track no that's fine the, the, the first thing to 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 be sure on is that i, I know of um, at least two instances where somebody has mistaken uh, a, a frigate bird for for a rope there's at least two. That's the absolute minimum. That it can happen with a frigate bird. These birds, I videotaped some in the Caribbean uh, a few years ago, not long ago. And um, it's possible, though that generally that's not what people see. But I'm just saying there are, of all the hundreds of cases I have, there are two that are uh, pretty clear on that. And there's another one which possibly could have been a misidentified frigate bird. It's. Um, yeah, that's we need to understand. Would that be because of the um, the long tail feathers and yeah. the, 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 the kind of uh, angular wings? Yes, the angular wings do resemble some uh, uh, living pterosaurs, and they don't have an obvious appearance of feathers, which can be really tricky. Uh -huh. um, though we need to understand that this is the, the, the just a tiny minority of these are misidentifications of frigate birds. For example, many um, sightings are very far from the ocean, and there's a number of sightings in certain states. And uh, for example, in in the United States, there are many sightings in uh, in Utah per, 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 in relation to the human population. Many sightings in Utah, and there are even more per human uh, in, uh, population in, in, in Hawaii. Well, Hawaii, you, you would know it's a big shock if you see a frigate bird and misidentify it for a rope, and perhaps, but not in Utah, not not in Kansas, not in Missouri, mm -hmm. not in Arkansas, not the central states of the United States where people constantly are reporting pterosaurs. And I also remember that the pterosaur reports come in a very great variety of size estimates. Now, of course, we know that these are... are estimates that people make from something they see in the sky but the the variety going all the way from uh three feet up to five ten fifteen twenty twenty five thirty forty five fifty feet <coughs> generally can't be can't be uh, attributed to frigate birds they don't have that variety of size you know. No, and i suppose even if somebody is looking up at the sky and that, of course it's hard to um to you know to approximate size with nothing uh, of scale up there but something that's four or five feet across and something that's 30 feet across is, is of a remarkable difference and these aren't things that you can make a mistake about again i say the same things about lake monsters sure they could be seals and eels and the rest of it but 40 feet long less likely <laughs> and i think that's you know one of the things people don't realize it's okay to make that straw man argument that it could be a frigate bird it could be something else but when you bring in the size of the creature that's harder to um you know that's harder to brush aside now i am very very interested um i'm very very interested in something you wrote about in your book called bulverism uh, um, that was very interesting to me, and I, I think I've encountered that on several occasions. <laughs> so I just yeah. wanted to get into that side of your work. Know, what is bulverism? Yeah. How do you counteract that? Well, that that word was uh, invented, of course, by C.S. Lewis, and he had, was, you know, this is half the middle of the twentieth century, and he recognized that. I don't remember if it was in the nineteen forties or not, but it was sometime around. Um, yeah, it's a habit. You know. 
now he he kind of got a very specific version of bovarism or what he called bovarism but i'll give you the general type it's when you have um some type of subject that's discussed and one side of the discussion or one point of view the person will start instead of talking about the subject itself or start saying how all oh, it's too bad that that guy is um is, you know, it's, it's fallen into the fallacy of believing that. But you can't, what can you expect from somebody that believes in the Bible or believes in uh -huh. these? <laughs> so it's a way of turning the things, uh, turning yeah. attention away from the subject and concentrating on an idea that your opponent has a problem and you just have to forgive him and excuse him because he has a problem and that he can't think straight or something. That's bulverism. Yeah. Now, I mean, that, that's something I've definitely encountered on, on several occasions myself. Um, of course, with the uh, the assassination being that you believe in another precept, which people may have an issue with. Um, now, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you there, but how would you counteract it? How do you counteract this bulverism? When you're trying to discuss your subject with somebody, you have research, you have evidence, you obviously talk to hundreds of witnesses, and then the bulverism comes into the argument. How do you counteract that and, and put your your point across? Well, I would say just bring up the, the word bulverism. And have you ever heard the, uh, the word bulverism? Do you know what that is? <laughs> do you know that? Do you know that? <laughs> Most of the people won't. They would do it because they've seen it used by somebody else. And they have no idea that it's a, it's a, um, it's a fallacy of reasoning. But uh, the... Wow. Uh, Bring up the word, and I do in some of my writings. I, I bring it up and I write about what it means, bulverism, and give examples of it, and and just uh, get the subject on that, and then try to get it back from that into the um, the subject. Now, it's it's possible to use something that might seem like bulverism if we're just it's, it's not a problem, and it's not really bulverism if we start and establish a communication about the subject. And then, if there's something that looks like one side has a problem then you can say oh maybe you weren't objective or something maybe you have these um these particular perspectives that are that uh, have a weakness in there in there um, in them they're not objective way to look at it but you always need to to to, to avoid wolverism we always need to, to stay on the subject at hand no I, I think that's that's perfect and also i love the um uh, the reply that the answer is in the question that what is bulverism is the defense. That's fantastic. And then that's really great. It, it actually brings me to the, the next aspect of this, which I think ties in uh, very closely. So in, in my personal cryptology uh, research, many of my followers and fellow colleagues would be unaware that I'm a Christian and a creationist. Uh, as a subject, it doesn't often enter the research I undertake. Um, I do, however, believe that in this hunt for the uh, unknown and thought to be extinct animals that we researchers have to learn to find common ground and, and common purpose uh, with our colleagues, regardless of their faith or philosophy. Um, so what experiences have you had personally on, on your expeditions, for example, when you've had to go out there uh, of working with people who are either opposed to research based solely upon your religious motivation? Um, or based upon their own religious motivation, perhaps, or, or philosophical outlook, and how do you reach out to people, um, you know, in in colleagueship who don't want to hear your argument? Yes, this came up um, in an interview I had with uh, a group in um, in England. What was it called? The, um, I can't remember the name offhand, but it was a group that brought up was the idea of well, um, well. You, Creationist, creationism, you know, and, and we have a, um, a some kind of bias in that. Well, actually, of course, everybody of any particular philosophy, yeah. origin philosophy, has has potential bias, and that's why we get such big objections from from people that say, "Oh, it can't be. It's just ridiculous. You can't be loving terrorists." Or, you know, um, and each of us has a potential for a certain bias, depending on what our philosophy or our, our perspective is on origin of life and so on. And we need to keep in mind that this, uh, be careful of avoiding this pitfall, you know, of saying, well, the other person is, is ridiculous and is biased and obviously because they can't think straight because, you know, they're a, a particular group, they're a member of this particular group, you know. 
uh, generally uh, brings to mind the, something very important about this, uh, this cryptozoology, and uh, we rely on uh, eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. Eyewitnesses from worldwide come from a variety of backgrounds. That means religious backgrounds too. And I've mm -hmm. seen that a number of times. They're not just, this is not people creationists calling me and says, oh, I was looking for a pterodactyl, and I think I saw it. No, it's not what people say. The general, they, they don't give any indication of any particular philosophy or religion or any uh, particular point of view generally about creationism. There are a few exceptions, but generally they don't give to me any sign of any particular uh, religious point of view that would, that would uh, have anything to do with a bias on their part. They were shocked and they didn't want to see a pterosaur, yeah. but they saw one. They didn't want to. They were not looking for one in general. And they just saw, and some of them are very good sightings. Now we talked about the, the frigate bird, and that's generally not what happens. People don't misidentify a frigate bird. Sometimes these um, flying creatures are in the ground. Sometimes they're close. Sometimes they're engaged in activity that frigate birds just would, would, would not do. Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't, um, you know, they're just, uh, it's just totally unlike. And when you get a good sighting in the daytime, and you get that detailed about the head crest, you know, frigate birds don't have a very long pointed horn like, um, I'm not sure that, a very hard, long horn like oh, yeah. thing. <laughs> frigate birds don't, don't have that, and it's very predominant in many sightings of ropings. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just people from all different cultures and religions and, and languages. Are, but it keeps on coming up these details like the flange at the end of the tail. You have a tail, mm -hmm. and a flange at the end of the tail. Well, this is something I, I'm very familiar with because I, I grew up in Wales and we have a dragon on our flag, albeit, you know, um, uh, modified. It has four legs and wings, but it has the flange of the tail, diamond shaped flange. And yeah. that, you know, that flag has existed for a long time. Um, I've yet to discover whether the flag was created before we knew about it. Uh, pterosaurs in the fossil record, but I, I believe that it may have been. And so many of our other dragons, like wyverns and things, also have that flange. And it's mm -hmm. a strange, um, I don't think it's something you can determine very well from fossils. So it's a strange aspect to add to these um, mythical, legendary animals. Uh, if yeah, if we only knew of them in the fossil records, it is a strange thing. It's not proof of anything, but it's something that always stood out to me. Here's this flag that we have for this dragon with a very strange diamond-shaped flange at the end of its tail. Yes, yeah. and the word diamond is, is actually common. When I get uh, people from different countries, actually, yeah, someone used the word diamond. and um, Even in Papua New Guinea and the Amboy Island, uh -huh. three, eye, three eyewitnesses I interviewed, incredibly good eyewitnesses, very credible. And they use the word diamond. They know some English. Now, they have some schools there, and they have learned some English, and they use the word diamond describing the end of the tale. But um, and concerning whales in England, you know, I have gotten some sighting reports from there. They're, they're, these are, are not animals that again became extinct in England long ago. They're still, uh, they're still occasionally flying over, um, over for places in England. Well, Shropshire, I mean, for example. You have you heard of Shropshire? I, I know. I know yeah. that sighting. That that's that's one of my favorite sightings from your site. Actually, two, two pterosaurs. Two from Shropshire I've gotten in the last eighteen months. So, so tell us uh, one or two of those, and I think some of our listeners would would uh, like to know about that Shropshire sighting and yeah. and any others. I know there've been some in the Pennines as well. Like any others you can think of uh, in England? It doesn't have to be all. Maybe maybe two, two or three. One in, uh, there's one in um, let's see, Hertfordshire. Uh, says I live in England in Hertfordshire. Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Hertfordshire. Uh, uh, Hertfordshire, but it's it's, it's right. Okay. Today I saw what I believe to be a pterodactyl. It was black. It was big black and had the thing on his head. That's what made made me notice it was not just any bird. So I tried to capture it on camera, but I panicked and I didn't manage to capture nothing but sky. Well, that's common. And then they would get the two from uh, Shropshire. Is that, am I pronouncing that right, Shropshire? Shropshire, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one was in September of 2017, so a year and a half ago. Uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is 
blank. I am a mother of four and I am 32 years old. I live in Britain on the Welsh border in an area called Whitchurch, Shropshire. And I now add that I am in the best of mental, best of health mentally. I do not take any form of narcotics, no prescription. But you know, she's she's a perfectly ordinary person. But um, uh, two weeks ago, 9 a.m. on Sunday, I went to the garden and so on. Um, she knows the wildlife and the birds and eagles and hawks. She knows all those, the geese, swans, she knows all of those things. She heard a un unusual sound. And well, this particular morning, I heard a very strange screech. I say strange that I had never heard it before, and it was very loud, almost resonant, resounding. Uh, and then she says, I saw two pterodactyls side by side flying past the tree. Now, at first I had to check myself because the thing I thought was our bloody big bird, that's no lie, but what struck me was that it had a giant sized beak and the wings had no feathers. And um, going on, this had, and, and, uh, is September of 2017. Mm. That's the first, and there's another one that uh, was actually a sighting earlier that year, but he didn't uh, report it until later, later that year. So that was the second report I got from Shropshire, but that actual sighting itself was a, a, a number of months before. Wow. I, I think it's really amazing that uh, in my, my book, in my study, which is separate to this piece of Britain, um, I've covered a few of the the pterosaur like sightings in the UK in the Pennines and some other places and also some historical ones around Pendlin Castle or mm -hmm. Pendlin Castle as we call it in Wales, uh, which is a, an old sort of third hand report. Uh, but I, I did and I have credited you for it, I did actually pop in the Shropshire uh pterosaurs because I thought that was a great sighting. And I've recently created a map, a piece of Britain map, in which they they appear on it. And uh, there's there's a little sort of uh, mug that comes with it as well, and I'd I'd love to send you one actually for your for Thank your you. office. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the research, and I I do think it's really seminal. There's nobody that I know anyway. I know you have colleagues, but there's nobody that I'm in touch with or aware of that's doing such thorough research on this subject. And um, if you say you've seen Nessie, and I deal with a lot of people who've seen Nessie or other lake and sea monsters around the UK, that will get some sort of attention. It's more People are more used to it, but you'll still lose a bit of credibility. Bigfoot, a bit less. But if you say you saw a pterosaur, where does that get you? You know, I think it's, um, and that's why a person has to write to you and say, I am not mentally ill or on drugs or, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Or, right. uh, or having an out-of-body experience in a mental institution somewhere, this actually happened to me. And um, yeah. I, I travel around the UK a lot. And I was in Loch Ness recently, and mm -hmm. even in this huge tourist area that receives 250,000 tourists uh, a year, mm -hmm. after dark, and I sat by the loch for a long time, it is black. It's completely black. The area is pristine, even this big tourist area. There are just forests and fields and hills everywhere, and barely any lights from the surrounding hotels and houses and i thought this is a huge tourist destination most of britain is like that um we're very uh underpopulated in the sense of urban sprawl we've got 10.6 percent urban sprawl of the entire country and i know having traveled to the u.s recently i was in um new england and in kentucky and a few other places yeah that so, um where you guys have masses just masses of untenanted unpeopled uh areas of land and it's it's phenomenal who are we to say especially in the nocturnal sense that something couldn't be surviving out there um by simply avoiding us and um i think it's it's part of our ego that we perhaps think that it's impossible that we haven't discovered everything on umboy island for example which is just dense jungle right <laughs> or um you know all of these other even lesser civilized, uh, in a way, of infrastructure uh, places in the world. Um, I, just before we finish the interview, I just wondered if you could tell people uh, if you have any upcoming expeditions in 2019 or or any ongoing research areas. Uh, you don't have to tell us what they are, but anything that you're particularly looking into in an ongoing way at the moment. Yes, yeah, so I could I could tell you a little bit. Although I, I I should say right right at the moment I'm looking at a photograph on my wall of me and members of my family on the shore of Loch Ness. And, you know, ah. 
1972. So I've really oh, wow. <laughs> I support anybody who wants to research the, the creature of Loch Ness and or anything similar anywhere. I totally support uh, and Bigfoot. Totally, totally support and and, and and appreciate what people do in other branches of cryptozoology. In my branch that my associates and I are in, uh, there is one. Um, uh, ongoing expedition process in Papua New Guinea from a man named Rex Yappy Epa. Uh, Rex and his uh, his uh, team members they have been searching for some time. Um, he actually was a witness before he actually was looking for the rope, and he was an accidental witness as he was going on a banana boat on the coast of, I think it was near Bunzel Station on the southern coast of Umboy Island, uh, and over the reefs, reefs there, and he saw the big tail sticking out of the, the body of the rope, and it was underwater. The big tail was sticking out. It was very long, and um, everybody in the boat was just, you know, kind of, kind of nervous and scared as they very quietly tried to get around before it saw them, but it was underwater mostly but then wow. uh, sometimes it, was, it was swimming underwater or it was um it was deep in water or that's, i'm not sure I just got the impression it was floating and with his tail and maybe it was trying to get uh, a giant clam or something i'm not uh -huh. sure uh you know they do use bioluminescent at night apparently to catch fish and giant and get some giant clams that possibly it's possible occasionally a rope and might go out in daylight to get a giant clam because that could be a difficult to get out of the water, out of its where it's as it's bad as sitting, you know. Uh -huh. So I, I just thought of that. Maybe that was a, an attempt to get a giant clam up. Um, anyway, we do have the shells, the empty shells of giant clams up, up inland on Umboy Island inland. The natives don't don't carry the shells up inland. And they say they they say that it's a rope and that, that takes the giant cl clams up there and eats them. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, Rex is actively involved. He's asking for donations for any anybody to make monetary donations. And um, I um, I did get a, a donation, an anonymous donation, uh, about a year ago for for him to be able to continue. But he he needs donations. So. That's a, That's a, and would we find him on your your living terrace or website? Some of them you rec look up Rex R E X and uh, Ropen, and you might find uh, one or two or more of my my web pages. Uh, we have a a, a group, uh, 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 this is a private group on uh, Facebook. But basically, um, people can get in touch with me if they need to. Uh, if they uh -huh. find my web pages, I have I make it, try to make it obvious how to to reach me through a, a, a email through a, um, a form on one of my pages and then they can uh -huh. send me an email but that I don't like to ask for direct email uh, because I, you know, I get a lot of spam. Well, that would, sure, <laughs> I get the same thing. I do use my direct email and I'm, I'm already reconsidering whether that was the, the best idea. Mm, well, but yeah. um, I mean, I, I think it's phenomenal work um I, we will put all of the links to all of your work on on the um the podcast when it goes out as well and i just just to finish up, i want to thank you very much for coming on it really has been enlightening and just to get your uh, your book out for everybody to see again that's uh, uh yeah. searching for opens and finding god now i do understand that you had to put um and finding god on to the title because somebody complained that it was misleading in some way and that's a shame but yeah. um I want to just sort of recommend this book to anybody who's interested in the search for robins, whether you're, you know, um, uh, a creationist, a materialist, an animist, a Jain, a uh, Jew, Muslim, whatever you are, yes. I don't think it will affect your appreciation of this book. And yeah. uh, Jonathan, thank you very, very much for, for coming on. It's been it's been wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Delighted. Uh, bye bye now. Bye bye.